Okay, let's look at this problem that you voted off the island. We have three identical stones, rocks, that are thrown by Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. And we're asked which of those rocks is going to be going fastest right before it plunks into the water. Now, if we think about this with the old school ideas, with kinematics, which we can, because this is a constant acceleration problem, it's gravitational freefall. And uh, if we do it that way, I think we can convince ourselves that Papa Bear's rock is going to go up and then come back down. And when it gets to the same level that it started at, uh, if it was going up at 15 degrees, it's going to be coming down at 15 degrees. And so I think that we can convince ourselves that Papa Bear's rock and Baby Bear's rock land in the water going the same speed. Certainly not at the same time. It's Mama Bear's rock that's the problem. See, Mama Bear's rock is going to be in the air for a longer amount of time. Baby Bear's longer than baby bears. Baby bears throwing his down towards the water, it's going to reach there first. Well, that means that mama bear's rock has more time to speed up in the y direction. But on the other hand, it also had more, uh, I'm sorry, less initial velocity in the y direction. So we would have to do a whole lot of calculation to find out whether this one was going faster or this one was going faster. We would have to break them up into their x and y parts, the velocities. We would have to add 9.8 meter per second, call it 10 meter per second, to the y part every second. And then we'd have to build the velocity vectors back together with Pythagorean theorem. But if we use energy, and we use the idea of energy conservation. Now to do that, we just have to ignore air resistance, which for a fairly heavy rock is is pretty good a, assumption. But if we do that, we ask ourselves, what kind of energy does the rock have at A? Well, it's moving, so it would have kinetic energy. You'll remember, kinetic energy is given by this formula. Trust me. It's up off the ground, and we're calling ground the level of the water, so it has gravitational potential energy, which is given by this formula. Trust me. And uh, just trust me till Friday. Now, at B, when it gets down here, if we call that height zero, there's no gravitational energy, it's only kinetic energy. And so I can write that equation this way. Now the important thing about energy is that it is not a vector. It's a scalar quantity. There's no energy to the west or energy to the east, there's just energy. And so that means that if the rocks are going the same speed, irregardless of direction, they have the same kinetic energy. If they are at the same height and have the same mass, they have the same gravitational energy. Well, what does that tell me about their final kinetic energy? Has to be the same. Now, you'll admit, that's trivial. That's just basic. And yet, we're missing some things. Because energy is a scalar, we will never, ever, ever learn anything about direction from an energy approach. We don't know what angle these rocks are going to hit the water. And the other thing we will never learn from an energy approach is what time they hit the water. We never learn about direction, and we never learn about time. But if all we care about is how fast they're going, and often that's what we care about, energy is the way to go. See if your neighbor got this problem right. 
Check with your neighbor. Better yet, ask your neighbor why he or she voted it off the island. Okay. Last day we talked about this total mechanical energy bucket. The combination of the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy buckets. And we said that it always stayed the same. That's what we meant by conservation. And yet there are lots of examples. I'll show you one right now. where that kinetic energy bucket just drained right away. Now if I call the level of the floor zero height, it never has any gravitational energy, so the kinetic energy is the total mechanical energy. I just had a situation where I had mechanical energy and I lost it. And you all know where it went, you heard it. Scraping going on, right? and the friction was bleeding that energy out. It was robbing the system of that energy. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is how that energy changes. Now we're going to start with an example in which the energy doesn't decrease, but instead it increases. If I have a 15 kilogram block that's mounted on wheels, and these wheels are made of the very finest steel, from the very finest factory in Sweden. It was built by a craftsman, Sven, okay? <laughs> and so the friction is negligible. So this, uh, this little block is initially traveling at five meters per second. And then we push on it in the direction it's going for 10 meters. And we want to know how much did we fill up that kinetic energy bucket? How much did we change the kinetic energy. Now I could solve that the old-fashioned way. I can calculate the initial kinetic energy, just one half times fifteen times five squared, and then I could use the kinematic equations to figure out how fast it's going after the push, and then I could calculate it again. But let me show you a better way, a way that will save you some time. Since we know that we never learn anything about time using energy, it makes sense that we start with the equation from kinematics that doesn't have time. And I'm going to just mess with that equation. It's not going to take long. It's not going to hurt. It's going to be very quick and painless. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract off the V initial square. And that'll get it out of the right-hand side and put it on the left-hand side of the equal sign. Now I've left some real estate here and some real estate there. I'm going to use that real estate. The next thing I do is I recognize that net force is what causes a mass to accelerate. And that means the acceleration is that net force divided by the mass. If I replace the acceleration in this formula with the force over the mass, it looks like this. Now I'm going to use that real estate. I'm going to get that m out of the basement by multiplying both sides of the equation by m. I'm then going to get rid of that 2 on the right by dividing both sides of the equation by 2. And now, that looks like an old friend. And to you, it should look like a new friend. That's a kinetic energy. And what I have there is just the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. Anytime I have final anything minus initial anything, that's the change. If we're talking about my change in weight over the holiday, over the break, 
It's my final weight minus my initial weight. That's how we find it. And that means that this thing over here is what causes the change. If this were zero, those guys would be the same. This is what causes the kinetic energy to change. And we call that, the force times the distance, we call it the varic. Now I've got to point out that we call it the varic here in this classroom. Anywhere else in the world, they don't call it varic, they call it work. But you people grew up in Montana doing work. You know work. And I'm here to tell you this physics varic is nothing similar to what you did on the ranch. Okay, and we'll talk about that in just, just a moment. Now, the reason I call it Varick is just to remind you that it's different than everyday work. I kind of German it up. Now, I, I recognize that the, the actual word for, for work is Arbeit, when Arbeit macht frei, but this is close enough. This will get us down the road. Uh, we wanted to put it this way in the textbook, but the, uh, the people that were reviewing the textbook thought that was just goofy. Okay? Now, if I look at that there, and I recognize that this is in newtons, and this is in meters, the units of there have to be newton meters. Newton meters. What do we call that? A joule. And since the right-hand side of the equal sign has to have the same units as the left, that tells me that energy must have units of newton meters or joules. Okay, now, this barrack has a complication, and that is that it's not always positive. Now, to uh, go back and solve this problem first, the easy way to solve it is to just say, hey, I have a two newton force acting over 10 meters, that gives me a varic, a positive varic of 20 joules. That positive varic is going to increase the kinetic energy bucket by 20 joules. That's the answer. That's the answer. <coughs> now, to look at this complication, I'm going to need some help. Barrett, thank you for volunteering. Would you come on up here? I appreciate it. Are you right-handed? Oh, that's so sad. Can you use your right hand? Barely. Okay. Put on the glove. <laughs> okay, it's a right-handed glove. If you would stand right here facing the class, what we're going to do is I'm going to try. Sorry. I'm going to get on this skateboard and I'm going to get myself racing across the room. And when I get right here next to Barrett, he's going to push me in the back. He's going to push in the same direction that I'm going. Are you ready, Barrett? I am. Okay. Now, this was easier when I was your age and your weight. Okay. Now, crawl off. You stay right there. As you can see, I sped up. My kinetic energy got bigger. And that meant that my change in kinetic energy was a positive change. We say that that change came from the varic that Barrett just did. And so we call that varic positive. Now here's why you have the glove there. This next time, as I come skating past, you just put the glove in my face and push the opposite direction I'm going. Are you ready? Anything, anything for the class, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's been wanting to do that and shut me up. Okay. That slowed me down. That decreased my kinetic energy. I would say that the change in kinetic energy is negative. If your bank account gets smaller, you, that's a negative change. Now in order to accomplish that, 
What Barrett did was negative Barrett. Whenever you push opposite the motion, you are doing negative Barrett. You are bleeding energy out of the system. Now, the last time, you definitely need that glove. As I come across the room, what I want Barrett to do when I get right here is just pull straight up and keep pulling straight up, completely straight up on my hair. <laughs> the hair and pull up. Oh, man. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's give him a hand, folks. I did not speed up. I did not slow down. I just kept going with the same speed. And this is what makes this physics work so different than everyday work, okay? If the push or pull is perpendicular to the motion, we say that the work is zero. Now that means that our, our formal definition for work is kind of messy. It's a positive force times the distance if those two are in the same direction. It's a negative force times the distance if those two are in opposite directions. And it's zero if those two are perpendicular to each other. Okay, now think about that for a moment. If you're on the ranch and you have a great big bale of hay on your shoulder and you have to load it onto the truck, but dang it, the truck is clear out of the road a mile away. So you walk with that bale of hay the whole mile. Now you're pushing on that bale of hay this way and you're moving that bale of hay that way Physics definition of Verk says you did no Verk. But you would expect to be paid, would you not? <laughs> yeah, you do want to be paid. Okay, now let me show you another example. Is there anyone here that bench presses? Come on, don't be shy. I'm gonna, thank you, sir, for volunteering. Come on down. Come on down. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. This is the first. Uh, all right. What's your name? Bennett. Bennett. Okay, I need you to lie on your back right there. Bennett, how much can you bench press? Oh, it's super... Uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Uh, he can bench press uh, 400 pounds. Ooh. Now, remember, each pound is is like five newtons. So that means he can bench press 2,000 newtons. It sounds more impressive than newtons. I love it? it, I love it. Okay, <laughs> now what I want you to do, Bennett, is just push that up at a slow, constant speed and stop at the top. Okay, as he's pushing that up at a constant velocity, how hard does he have to push if this weighs 2,000 newtons? Does he have to push harder than 2,000 Equal to 2,000 or less than 2,000? If he has constant velocity, that's zero acceleration. Do your free body diagram. He has to push exactly 2,000 newtons. Now he has to push a little bit harder to get it started, a little bit less to get it stopped. But on average, he's pushing exactly 2,000 newtons. And he's pushing it up about half a meter. Now he's pushing up and it's moving up. What flavor of Verk is Bennett doing, positive or negative? Positive, positive Verk, and how much, how many joules? 2,000 newtons, half a meter, 1,000 joules, okay, of positive Verk. Now Bennett, I want you to just slowly bring that down to your chest and stop. Okay, now Bennett was pushing on that up 
and it was moving down. What flavor of verb was he doing? Negative. negative. And he was doing negative. He had to push with 2,000 pounds up. A little bit less to get it started, a little bit more to get it stopped. But 2,000 pounds for half a meter. <coughs> he did negative 1,000 joules. Now what I'd like you to do now, Bennett, is just slowly up, slowly down. Slowly up, slowly down. A little slower, okay? Plus 1,000 joules, minus 1,000 joules. Plus 1,000 joules, minus 1,000 joules. Plus 1,000 joules, minus 1 joules. Why do we call this a bear count? <laughs> he is doing no bear, according to the physics definition. Let's give him a hand, folks. Thank you. Okay. Now, clearly, Clearly, this physics verb uh, is different than what we every day uh, call work. And often, often, that's what gets in the way of our understanding, is many times we have used the same words in physics that have already been used in everyday life. We're going to find next week that Physics use of the word elastic is way different than what you think of when you think of elastic. Okay, so, so this is something that you have to be aware of to guard against. Now, let's practice with this example. I have a rope that's pulling with 1,000 newtons on a block, and it's pulling at an angle of 37 degrees. And the question is, how much verk is done by that force of a thousand newtons? Does anyone want to ask me a question? Yeah, how far does it move? Let's say it moves five meters to the right. Now, how many joules of verk is being done by that one thousand newtons? Talk to your neighbor. Okay, on the count of three, shout out your answer. One, two, three. And a mighty shout went up in the land. One, two, three. Four thousand. Thank you. Thank you. Now, folks, this messy definition of Eric kind of undoes some of the joy that I gave you on Monday. On Monday, I told you that energy is a scalar, it's not a vector. And some of you were doing the happy dance because you don't like vectors. You don't like breaking vectors up into components. That was the part of the last exam that you hated. Well, the truth is, because Verk has this complicated definition, we still have to worry about vectors. If I take that vector, that force of 1,000 newtons, I have to break it up into components. I have this component that's in the same direction as the motion, I'll call that F parallel, and that's going to be 800 newtons if that's 37 degrees. I then have this component, we'll call that F perp, it's 600 newtons. Again, this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle. Now, this force, parallel to the motion, does positive air. It's in the direction of the, of the motion. And so the verb done would be 800 newtons times 5 meters, or 4,000 joules, newton meters. This force here is like when Barrett was pulling up on my hair. Okay? It does no verb. Truthfully now. 
just between us. Were you surprised the hair didn't come off? <laughs> just a little bit? Huh? Just a little bit? Yeah. It's my hair. <laughs> it's just ugly. <laughs> but it's mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, I promised you that eventually we would have three buckets of energy, and right now we just have two. And uh, my apologies to those of you that have already been to this week's tutorial. Uh, in a perfect world, you would have had this lecture before going to that tutorial. Uh, but the way the, uh, uh, the schedule worked out this semester, it just didn't happen. Um, we already have a kinetic energy bucket. And remember, energy is the capacity to do damage. When something's going fast, it can crash, it can break things. We also have this gravitational potential energy. And it's called potential because it has the potential to do damage. A, a boulder at the top of the cliff, if you're walking at the bottom of the cliff, should scare you. If someone were to tip it off the cliff, it could turn that potential energy into kinetic energy, which could then crash into you and do damage. Now, let's talk about a new bucket. A bucket that has to do with the energy in a spring. If we think of energy as the capacity to do damage, is there energy in this little toy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, I got to tell you, it's, it's great being an old man. I mean, not always great. I mean, in the morning, it's not so great. But, <laughs> but I can get away with this, you know. Uh, I've been doing it for years. And, and my younger colleague, Shannon, uh, she had to teach 205 one year. And so she did that. She pointed it at the student in the front. And the next thing we knew, uh, the president of the university had received a scathing letter about how the student was threatened. His life was threatened in uh, class. And then it went to the department head, and then I had to write letters. But I've got tenure. I can, I can shoot you all. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Uh, but clearly, clearly, when you have a spring that's compressed or stretched, there's a capacity to do damage. There's energy stored. Have any of you changed the struts on a car? Any of you? Oh, that's scary. I did it once. I'll never do it again. I was, I was being cheap. From now on, if I need that done, I'm going to pay someone else to risk their life. You know, I did it on a, a little car, a K car. Why would you fix a K car, you say? Yeah. Anyway, this spring was all compressed, and one of the things you have to do is you got to release it. And the, the, the trick is releasing it so that it doesn't go through you. Okay? So this energy is real. Now, how big is it? In order to understand that, we need to, uh, we need to understand Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law is named after Robert, Robert Hooke, who was a contemporary of uh, Isaac Newton. And by contemporary, what I really mean is Isaac's pain in the butt. Okay, every single time Isaac came up with something, calculus, Robert was right there. Oh, I invented the calculus last week. I just forgot to write it down. You know, gravity. Oh, I already thought of that. I was telling the guys at lunch. Everything that Isaac came up with, Robert said he came up with first. So finally, to get him to go away, we gave him Hooke's Law. <laughs> this is what it is. If you put a mass on a spring, it stretches. Pretty profound? Okay. And we call that stretch delta S. Now, if I want to stretch that by twice as much, how much mass you figure I better put on there? 
twice as much. <laughs> That's not law. He got famous for that. <laughs> I'm never going to be famous, but he got famous for that. <laughs> okay, so let's look at this. Um, the bottom of this spring is right at 10 centimeters. If I put half a kilogram on here and let it hang, the bottom of the spring is now at 22. It stretched it by 12 centimeters. If instead I put a whole kilogram on there, twice as much mass, now it's down, the bottom of the spring is at 34, that's a stretch of 24 centimeters. Twice the stretch for twice the pull. Hook's law. Okay? Now, the way we write that mathematically is that the force exerted by the spring is proportional to how much you stretch it. Okay? We said it opposite here. We said the amount you stretch the spring is proportional to how hard you pull on it. But it dances both ways, forwards and backwards. Now, that's the force exerted by the spring. That's what we call the spring constant. More about that in a second. And that's just how far the, the end of the spring is displaced from equilibrium. The length that spring wants to be, the, the length the spring was when it came out of the box from the factory. How much you change that length. Now, this spring constant, oh, first of all, let's talk about that minus sign. That minus sign just tells me that if I pull the spring down, the force by the spring is up. Again, that's not very profound. But that minus sign can get in our way. We already have way too many minus signs in this class, and this one's just never, ever important. So we're typically going to just ignore that minus sign and just use the, uh, the magnitudes. Now, if I want to know what that k value is, set that delta s equal to 1 in your mind. One unit of length. In the units that we use, one unit would be one meter. That tells you that K is the force that you would have to pull on a spring in order to stretch it or compress it one meter. Now, folks, if you stretch this spring by one meter, you buy it. Okay, because it's never going back into this shape here. You're going to stretch it all the heck. Okay, so, so that definition is going to work with the great big springs that they have on the roller coasters at Disney World. You can stretch them by a meter or compress them by a meter. For this one, what I would do is I would, I would measure how hard I have to pull to stretch it one centimeter. And then I'd multiply that force by 100. By 100. Okay, now this k value, we call it the force constant, it tells us how stiff the spring is. The bigger the k, the stiffer the spring. So that means that the, the spring on a, a car, a Chevy, is going to have a huge k value. And this little guy here would have a very small k value. Okay. The bigger the K, the scarier the spring. The more energy can be stored in that spring. Okay? Now the units of your K value, your spring constant, are newtons. Pronounce this for each meter. Or the newtons required to stretch the spring one meter. One meter. Let's see if you understand this by solving this problem. You have a bungee cord that's 50 meters long. And then we just, for whatever reason, decide to hang Professor Steve Iger on it. Turns out Steve's mass is 80 kilograms. He's a little sensitive about that. Please don't spread that around campus. Uh, what's the spring constant for this bungee cord? The bungee cord acts like a spring. And so solve this problem. And tell me what your answer is.
Okay, if you haven't got your attendance points, get lucky. Okay. The answer is indeed E, but not by an overwhelming majority. Um, let's do it together. We have this bungee cord hanging down from the ceiling. It's 50 meters long. And if we hang Professor Eiger from it, um, what we find is that it's 80 meters long. What we care about is this stretch, how much it changed from its normal length. We call that delta S, and it would be 30 meters. Well, by Hooke's law, and I'm going to leave out the minus sign, <coughs> I'm looking for K. The delta S is 30 meters, so if I knew how hard the spring was pulling on the professor, I'd be done. Well, that requires a free body diagram. The earth is pulling down on the professor with a weight force the mass times 9.8, call it 10, or 800 newtons. The core is pulling up on the professor. If he's not accelerating, just dangling there, this would also have to be 800 newtons. So if I plug in 800 newtons here and solve for K, I get 27 newtons for each meter. Okay, check that your neighbor got that right, please. <coughs> okay, this is our final bucket. The energy, potential energy stored in a spring depends on the spring constant, how stiff that spring is, and it depends on how much you stretch it or compress it squared. So that means you pull a spring twice as far from equilibrium, you have stored four times as much energy. Now, you'll notice K is always positive, it's just, it's, it's a pull per meter. It's by definition positive. Delta S, because it's squared, that's gotta be positive. So my spring energy is always positive. Likewise, my kinetic energy is always positive. Mass is positive, V squared is always positive. The gravitational potential energy will always be positive if you choose the lowest point in your problem to be zero height. And that way all energies will be positive. It will simplify the problem. Folks, a word. On the first and second exams, I gave you every equation you needed for success. I'm not here to see whether you can memorize. I'm here to see whether you can solve problems using the ideas of physics. And that's why I gave you any, any equation you needed. What I found over the years is that if you don't memorize these formulas, all of them, you don't recognize the players on the field. It's like watching the Super Bowl and not having a clue what the rules of the game are. You're just going to enjoy the commercials. That's all you're going to enjoy. Okay? So, I will not put these equations on the front page of the next exam. If you ask the proctor for one of these equations, he or she will be under oath not to give it to you. Not because we hate you, but because we love you. Because we want you to succeed. And you're going to succeed if you recognize the players on the field. Okay? You've got to memorize it by the next exam. You just as well do it now. Now, one last example, 
We have a block, 10 kilograms, and it's pushed up against a spring, not connected, but just pushed up against, and a hand compresses the spring by pushing against the block. Now it compresses the spring by half a meter. The spring constant on that spring is 16,000 newtons per meter. Now that tells you whose hand that is. That can only be Arnold Schwarzenegger. That is the governator right there. Okay, <laughs> the only person that could do that. Now, how much energy is stored in that spring? Well, let's just use our formula. Spring energy is one half k delta s squared. That's going to be one half times sixteen thousand newtons for each meter times a half meter squared. Well, a half squared is a fourth, half of a fourth is an eighth, an eighth of 16,000 is 2,000 joules. Okay? 2,000 joules. And if I call this height zero, then there's no potential energy. And, and the block's not moving right now, so there's no kinetic energy. And so that's the total, 2,000 joules. Now I need to explain some notation. When we work these problems, there will be parts of the floor that are rough, that scrape, and parts of the floor that are frictionless. I use this hash mark notation to indicate where I've got a rough surface and I use a smooth line to represent where I've got a frictionless surface. Okay? Now, in this problem, the hand releases the block, and you're asked, well, what's the kinetic energy of the block when it gets to point A? Now, there's a hard way to solve this and an easy way to solve this. The hard way to solve it would be to say, oh, kinetic energy is one half m v squared. I know the m is 10. I better go find v. But there's a better way. The better way is to say, hey, I had 2,000 joules. It's a frictionless floor. I still have 2,000 joules. But now, those 2,000 joules are in the kinetic energy bucket. End of problem. Except, you need to justify why that frictionless floor does zero verk. Why? Tell your neighbor real quick. Why does a frictionless floor do zero verk? Now, I often ask that question on exams, and the most common wrong answer is, a frictionless floor does no verk because it's frictionless. Does that seem like circular reasoning? Yeah. Okay. Uh, a frictionless floor still pushes on the block. It pushes with a normal force. And remember that normal means perpendicular. Perpendicular to what? Perpendicular to the floor. So if the normal force is always perpendicular to the floor, and the block is always moving parallel to the floor, the force and the displacement are 90 degrees to each other. And by our definition of Verk, that's zero Verk. And that means that the kinetic energy, uh, the energy is going to be conserved. So the energy is going to be 2,000 joules. Now I can find the speed of the block. I just plug in 2,000 joules for the kinetic energy. I plug in 10 kilograms for the mass, and I solve for V. I get 400 is equal to V squared, or V is equal to 20 meter per second. Easy peasy, okay? Now, here's where we're going. Before you leave, 
where we're going is answering this question. When the energy is not conserved, it starts scraping across that rough surface, and the question is, how far will it scrape before coming to a halt? That's a good stopping place. We'll see you on Friday. We'll finish this problem on Friday.